Hi everybody, I'm Allison with Allison Kent Home Kitchen, a site for all things kitchen. And today we're talking to Chef Robin Court of Swallowtail. Just get her in here. Of Swallowtail, which is the best gourmet experiences BC has to offer. I saw that on your website, the best. <laughs> I love the gourmet experiences. Hey, um, sorry, I missed what, all of what you said. I, just, I was just, while I was bringing you in, I was just introducing who you were. But oh, I read oh, on your website I, that it's the best gourmet experiences BC has to offer. Oh, yes, definitely. That's a claim <laughs> to fame. I like it. <laughs> After the pandemic, I should say. <laughs> Post-pandemic. Well, yeah. you still, though, today I was signed up for the um, forging beginner class. So, yep. Online. Don't need to worry about pandemic for that one. Totally. And we'll get to that, but why don't you tell us a little bit about Swallowtail? Um, yeah, so Swallowtail is, is basically about 12 years ago, I um, decided to step back into the kitchen because um, I grew up in Vancouver, so cooking in kitchens here. Uh, and then I went off into the land of video games um, as a video game artist for many, many years. And then... Um, and then I got sick of being in an office. So I was like, hey, you know, let's let's start a business, but not, I didn't want to work in a restaurant, you know, the daily grind all the time sort of thing. Um, so I opened a restaurant in my house, basically. It was a, so that's Swallowtail Secret Supper Club. Um, and I ran that for two years, four days a week, um, you know, lots and lots of dinners. And it was really fun. Four uh, days a week? You yeah, doing? it was crazy. Yeah, we don't do that anymore. That that's what you know. Basically, I then started sort of getting out of the kitchen and organizing pop up events and that sort of thing because my boyfriend was like, "I just I can't do this." Yeah, <laughs> that that's a lot. Four days a week is a lot. Yeah, yeah that exactly. was how I found out about you. Was um, a friend invited me to this like hush hush underground secret club dinner kind of thing, and it was just so cool. And uh, what did we do? We had, we brought our own wine, but I think you guys told us kind of what we were eating generally. Yep. But in short, the chef basically had gone to the market that morning, decided what was fun to cook with or just in season or available or plenty, and um, cooked how many courses? I don't remember. Five? Usually it's minimum five up to, I think we've done nine um, but those ones are really long evenings. So usually we stick to five. <laughs> you need two bottles of wine for those ones. <laughs> yeah. The summer ones are actually longer because they're, uh, we have the, um, big garden in my backyard. And so those ones, yeah, those ones, people just want to chill and, you know, as soon as it starts warming up, you know, like even hopefully regulations will change and we can be okay with being together again. And we'll, I mean, we'll start the supper club up again when we're okay to be outside together, basically. So it'll happen, but who knows? It was where. really cool. We were sitting, my husband and I and our friends were sitting up on the balcony. Oh, cool. And then, yeah, yeah once we looked over, we realized there's a whole nother table down on the, in the garden, which was really cool. Yeah. How many people were there average on the dinners? Um, 40 is our max. Um, but yeah, it's just sort of, depends on the chef as well. So. Um, when I stopped cooking full time, I started collaborating with other chefs around Vancouver or guest chefs that were coming from France and Texas and different places from around the world. And for those ones, um, it, yeah, it, it was like, you know, chefs that wanted to step out of the kitchen and cook exactly what they wanted to cook, regardless of ingredients costs or whatever, just like, you know, it's sort of like dream meals for them. So, so in those ones could be, you know, Maybe they want to cook for less people. Maybe they want right. to, you know, yeah. those stipulations were, I, I definitely left it to the guest chef of the day to choose it. But what a good venue. Like a lot of the restaurants do, they have the same menu for year after year. Not everybody does seasonal things, or even if they do seasonal things, it's the same seasonal thing they made last season. So, or like last year. So it's nice for them to kind of go flex their muscles a bit and get their creativity on and, I think yep. the person that was cooking the night I was there had just come off around with the cruise ships or something. And she just wanted to like cook for just 40 people for a night. <laughs> <Totally>. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not for 4,000 people or whatever she yeah. was used to cooking for. That it was a really cool thing. I really enjoyed it. Was it Natasha? 
Oh, it, I, I would be hard pressed to remember how many years ago it was actually right now. I want to say like three years ago. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. It might've been Natasha. She's, she's like seafood pescatarian special specialist. Um, she worked on yachts forever. So, um, so really she was one of the funnest people for me to work with because, um, because I do all the foraging now. Right. So if, and that's my focus and that's what my, you know, my passion for both Swallowtail as well as my own cooking style. So, you know, um, I have a place on Galliano. I could get sea urchins. I could get, you know, seaweeds. I could mushrooms in season, whatever. But with her, it's like I could really flex my seafood muscles and uh, have her do something cool with it. That's, it's a great thing for everybody like the guests really enjoyed it we were talking to all the people around us and they all love food obviously so you already have something in common you know the chef is getting to do something interesting it's just the poor people with the dishes that probably <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> so you have the secret dinners hopefully starting again and you did a few pop-ups i think we did a dinner with you that was um carnivorous or the carnivoria yeah. Carnivoria. Best. Yeah. <laughs> we did that one and we had our whole family was here quarantining. So there was eight of us quarantining together. So I think we even doubled it up and added things to it. It was such a feast. It was really good. Yeah. Yeah. That's the best. And, and actually Carnivoria is one of our annual traditional events. So every summer we usually it's at the supper club or at one of my uh, pop-up venues around the city. Um, but because we couldn't last year because of the pandemic, yeah. we were like, let's do takeout. And so, voila. <laughs> and we've done a few takeouts, but. I mean, that's a different way for a chef to get to flex a different muscle too, right? Like they can maybe cook something off menu for that one night that you're doing, you're hosting the takeout. Yep. And it helps to support the local restaurants. And like, that's an all in all good thing too. Totally. Yeah. Poor chefs right now. I mean, yeah, it's a hard time, but. It's yep. a tough one, but things like that are really supporting them. I think it's just thinking creatively and out of the box and how do we still get like numbers into your restaurant or your food experience of your food or whatever? Yep. And also just like provide something, you know, Swallowtail has always been about providing a unique, you know, a totally different sort of experience than a typical restaurant. Um, so yeah, it's been, and that's usually my mandate is to come up with the new experience or come work with a new, you know, I work with chefs, but I also work with uh, fishermen and hunters, you know, we do like a, a game um, supper club or pop up as well as like online features on that sort of thing in fall, right? Because I, I work with a chef that hunts for her own meat, right? So she has access to like moose and elk and all these beautiful meats that you can't buy at the grocery yeah. store or get in restaurants, right? So, um, so yeah, like Swallowtail is definitely especially now it's an information source. So with the online foraging school and um, all of my YouTube sort of cooking, you know, snippets and tips and tricks for foraging and then cooking things. Um, yeah, I just want to like, that's how I want to break people out of this funk and like just get them thinking about nature and eating. <laughs> well, your website, your your newsletters are packed full of information and recipes and like classes and and things still moving and shaking. But then your blog too is just, I was sifting through it again the other day. I hadn't looked at it in a little while and I was sifting through it again the other day. I'm like, this is a wealth of information. <laughs> like yeah. you could write volumes of books <laughs> with all the knowledge bumping around in your head, I'm sure between the foraging and putting a dinner together and the fact that you are a chef, right? And the, um, everything that just kind of came with that and I can't even fathom how much knowledge is in your brain it's crazy <laughs> and the blog is like you know I've been writing that for 12 years so and whenever anyone comes whatever on a mushroom tour hunt with me and they're like oh I really want to know about this or how do you make a spore print you know how as a tool to identify a mushroom sort of thing right um, so I'll do little sort of tips and tricks and I don't know just fun things to do with your kids or whatever uh, whatever sort of flavor of the week. <laughs> well, I like the family aspect too. I sent my son and my husband on one where you did the, um, is it sea foraging or yep. 
and hunted for the Dungeness and I guess, did you do some other stuff? They were on it and I wasn't, but I think the only thing he focused on after that was Dungeness. And after that, every weekend he was down on a pier with his little crab traps and catching. <laughs> we once caught, we did our limit once and we caught four each and oh, you got that pricked. was a good meal back at home. And then after that, <laughs> he would catch maybe a couple, but that yeah. one time was just a haul. And he loved it. Now that's just part of his thing, right? Like you taught him how to fish. You cool. literally taught him how to fish. And now he can go out any weekend or in season, I guess, or when they're actually, I think it's the tides. The tides bring in the crabs. The, yep. Uh, yep. You want higher tide and winter is actually the best time to fish for them because they're all plump and uh, filled out into their shell because otherwise oh. in, in summer they molt. So sometimes you get really like, you know, crabs with very little meat in them. So oh. winter is like when the water quality is like, and the crabs are ready to, so no one really wants to fish in the winter, but that's kind of when you should be. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> he will be out there. When he gets a day off work, he will be out there. <laughs> He's working like four jobs right now. Um, and your background is, do you trained as a chef? You went to. Yep. Yeah. So I, I trained as a chef and I worked, um, ended up working like when I was quite young. So yeah, I'm older now. Um, but yeah, so when I was uh, 15, I started working in the restaurant industry. Um, and so I did that for about five years in Vancouver, working for lots of different restaurants that aren't here anymore. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right? It's like the, the turnover in Vancouver, it always has been this way, but now even yeah. more, right? Even more so for sure, yeah. No, oh, it's crazy. Um, yeah, so that, and then then also, you know, part of the supper club, like, 12 years ago was for me to stage with other chefs. So I did a stage in Barcelona. I lived there for a while. Um, so working with different restaurants, my favorite restaurants in the area sort of thing. Um, and I ended up having to come home just because of, um, it was really hard to get a visa to actually permanently work there. To, as, oh, as okay. Well. Yeah. Um, so I would have been there, but I'm here now. <laughs> and we're all the better for it yeah, yeah well and also i don't know about um where i don't know where you were you were in barcelona did yeah. you say yeah. yeah so the foraging there versus the foraging in a city like vancouver totally different and yeah yeah like i mean i will say this is a little off kilter but i noticed <laughs> that's so, okay <laughs> yeah so we we were living in the Graciette neighborhood and there's all these little parks these beautiful little kind of you know small parks not like parks that we have here right yeah. um and i noticed these older spanish men would be out there and they were picking something in the you know in the, in the meadows and stuff there and so i was i'd watch them right and then i finally realized they were picking wild asparagus and and they're like oh, cool. these thin 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 you know we get those yeah. fat asparagus the the wild ones are very thin and so I just, I kept watching them and, and then I started going and harvesting my own, right? So whenever I'd see them, I'd be like, oh my God, that's, that's asparagus. That's so, cool. <laughs> yeah. so that was like the only little tiny bit of foraging. And, you know, it's very urban there. So it's like, it kind of felt a little too, <laughs> too urban. Yeah. But I mean, they were very tasty. Oh my God, best asparagus I've ever had in my entire life. <laughs> well and as far as foraging whether you're foraging out of the ocean or the forest or the meadow or whatever it just doesn't get any fresher like, yeah you literally cannot get fresher food than having gone and picked it that day or like that a couple hours before during a nice walk with your family too right totally yeah and so there's just like no downside to all that no exactly like um and even so um, in winter, I focus a lot on seaweeds and harvesting seaweeds because it's oh, yeah, yeah. great because it's an ingredient that people don't think of in Vancouver. We're such yeah. meat eaters here, even though we're at the sea, which is such a strange thing for me. But um, because we have that place on Galliano, it's like I have access to like super clean water and great, great seaweeds. So I'll, I'll go and harvest bull kelp, for example, is one of my favorites. And you can eat the whole thing. Um, oh, really? Yeah, and the stipe, so the stem, uh, yeah. that's sort of, you know, the ball that floats on top and stuff, um, you can slice that up and make a pickle out of it, which is like really crunchy. And yeah. when you add the vinegar to it, it goes bright green, so it's quite beautiful. And it's oh. uh, salty of the sea, you never have to salt anything, and it's got that umami quality. Um, I even, I, I have a little show and tell for you. I made a little furakake, so like a... Yeah. 
rice mix out of bulk kelp, uh, toasted sesame seeds, and Szechuan green peppercorn. And it's like, you put this on rice, you put this on fish, Ooh. and it's like, it tastes like BC, right? But it's yeah. just like this great little mm, yummy. And yummy. you make that yourself? You dehydrate the... Yep. Yep. I can even, I'll show you a little... Show and tell. Show and tell. So, so that... do you just naturally dry that? In the sun. In the yep. sun? So this is bull kelp. Right, so that's this is the blade, sort of the the you yeah. know the leaf that comes off the the float, right? And so you know I just roast that either in the oven, which gives it a more caramely taste, or sun dried, which will keep more of its greenness. Right. Um, but yeah, and then you just put that in the food processor and blend it up, and this is your salt. Like you don't need any other yeah. salt, um, and it's super super tasty. So yeah, actually. Now I feel bad because I literally just bought like a jar and I can't remember how much I paid for it, but it was like a jar of dried seaweed as, as a spice, as a flavoring, yeah. right? And I'm like, I could have just picked it up out of the water down the street, man. <laughs> but that I wouldn't recommend. So cause anywhere near Vancouver, no. you need to go somewhere cleaner water, basically. Right. Like you could, if you were like, people ask me a lot of time, you know, zombie apocalypse, can I eat, you know, yeah. the shellfish from Jericho or the, <laughs> you know, the you know, bull kelp or the seaweed yeah. or whatever, right? And it's like, yeah, zombie apocalypse, go for it, eat the seaweed, right? Yeah. Like, it's pro it's not a filter, you know, like a bivalve sort of thing, or right. clam, which are the more risky sort of uh, filters. That's why you can never clam, obviously, on, on Jericho or anywhere. But um, but with seaweed, it's, it's less less worrisome, but. And I think I read that seaweed doesn't get affected by red tide or? Correct, yep, okay. yep. Totally. So as long as you're not in the, where all the pollution is, you yep. can eat it all year long, all year yeah. round. Okay, totally. cool. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna get my forage on. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. um, when you were doing the tours, are you still doing tours? Uh, we aren't no so no. we had one scheduled for end of february and because we're still in lockdown we canceled it um because i guess it's hard to socially distance so even though you're outside no. and you're just wandering the forest it's no it's easy to socially distance it's just that right now you can't you can't be in any groups sort of thing without that's not your household right so as soon as they open that up into your safe six um yeah. then it's possible to do private tours with us so you could book a your safe six for, oh. right? um yeah and we we have like lots of different wildcraft experts so from mycologists to biologists i work with laurie snyder who's a, a metis medicinal um specialist so medicinal plants and uh fungi as well so she's a really cool one to do a walk with in spring um yeah so we're gonna so we'll do the private things so that'll probably be the first opening up we have on the website, so it's swallowtail.ca, we have March and June. We have all of our classes, our infield classes, set up. And, you know, if you're interested, you can get a ticket. And then I'm always going to refund, you know, obviously, if yeah. we get shut down, you get it refunded, right? Um, we even have our mushroom tours, which start in September, that are set up already. And then we're going to do probably a morel hunt in spring. So, um, yeah. I'll so set up for that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's, that's what's your favorite season to forage in? Fall for mushrooms. Fall. Yeah, I mean, I do love the winter oysters. I just it's my birthday yesterday. Um, yeah, somebody just said happy birthday, Robin, on here. I noticed. <laughs> um, yeah, it was my birthday, so I got a ton of oysters, Kis uh, Kisu oysters. So not Kishu, but Kisu. Yeah. So I think they're from Pender Island. They are so good and plump and like not, um, you know how you, you eat oysters in summer and they can be like foosty and kind of like overly creamy because that's when they're like reproducing. So they right. taste muddy, right? Winter is just like, oh, it's like the only time I'll eat oysters. They're so yummy right now. It's crisp and clear. Mm, and So tasty and salty. These were... Oh. Salty. Now I'm getting a craving mm -hmm. for oysters. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> Have some bubbly with it. Oh, always. <laughs> always. My wine friend said bubbly goes with everything, but obviously, especially oysters. Yes, totally. Oh, my God. Oh, and also uh, truffles. So I just did, um, uh, for Valentine's Day, we did a truffle, online truffle cooking class. Yeah. And 
and yeah, bubbly with, with that. I had people hand making pasta and cream sauce and then serving the bubbly with that. Perfect. And can you find truffles locally now? Yep, you can. Yep. So actually one of the person, uh, one of the people that were taking the class, uh, I had a live session with them yesterday and she had a truffle dog. I was like, where did everyone get their truffles? And she was like, oh, I went out <laughs> into the forest and got my own. I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> you are next level. <laughs> <laughs> and then for you to say somebody else is next level, that's pretty next level. <laughs> yep. No, that's beyond me. No dogs here. That's like all kinds of levels now. <laughs> well, I had heard that um, it was kind of starting and then there, there's actually, and I think in Oregon, there's like an entire truffle week in January that you can go yeah. down for. But the person I wanted to take was my son, who's now only 17, but we wanted, oh, he's only 15. No matter what, he wasn't the U.S. drinking age. So he wasn't allowed to go to half of the conferences because it was all something Aww. with truffles, right? Yeah, yeah. So I was like, okay, well, maybe we'll wait till you're 21 and then we'll go down for whatever truffle fest. It sounded like it was quite intense. I have no idea. Ah, uh, 21. It's just like, that's even longer. You have to wait. You know, you're like, oh, but he's... He's legal. <laughs> I, I was Here. like, can I get him a fake ID just to go to truffles? <laughs> just Good for mom. truffle hunting? I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. He's, um, it sounds very similar to your path. He started working in restaurants at 15. So he's 17 now and working in quite a few restaurants locally. Yep. And it is hard seeing kind of firsthand through him how hard it is for a lot of these chefs and restaurants and people who are just they're like a lot of the people in my world they're just so creative and once you can't use that creativity for the things you want to use it for it it must be really tough for sure yeah and they're making even more reduced menus right so it's like because it's it, you know you have to make your ingredients go as far as they can and only order a certain amount of things and you you know you yeah you're it's kind of cool. Some people are being really sort of proactively creative with it in like, it's sort of like Iron Chef, right? You're like, okay, I don't have access to these expensive ingredients yeah. anymore. How do I reduce my menu, but still make something super tasty? That I just have what's in this box. What do I yeah. do? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which <laughs> is the favorite. mystery box or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. um, that was going to lead me to something. Oh, I forgot my question. It was about the... Um, TV and the chefs, but I'll remember it later. For now, you have your blog and your tours and your suppers. And what's next for 2021? Um, well, hopefully we'll have, so we're doing some sea foraging um, infield classes. So, um, and that's with chowder on the beach. So basically we take people out uh, and they bundle up and, um, you know, you bring like whatever hot tea or something like that. And then I'll make a chowder. Um, I'll harvest stuff from Galliano probably for that, bring samples so you can see like bulk kelp, et cetera, all the different things that you can make out of these. Because we like, for, with the sea foraging, we like to focus on um, things you can harvest without a boat. So it's really accessible to people, right? Because, yeah, most people don't have those things. No, um, not everybody has a boat. And your yep. tours, uh, do they all always include a lunch or a dinner, like a meal component? Not always. Not always. Usually, they did in the past, but because of COVID, um, it's just made it a lot harder. So... Uh, for example, our fall mushroom infield tours, um, we do them at Alora Seamer Conservation Reserve, and uh, we didn't have any food with them last year. So the year before, yes, we always made wild mushroom pate, and, you know, you get to sample a few things. And, but now it's like two hours of, you know, chock-a-block education, so you get more info to go forage for your own stuff. Um, but yeah, you didn't, you know, get my pate. But my recipe's online, so... <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the 300 recipes on your website. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's amazing. And so we are starting, you and I, are starting together a four-part series on foraging through the seasons that we're starting tomorrow. Yep, I'm excited. Winter. Yay, so tomorrow we're going to talk all about winter foraging. And people can also check out, obviously, your website. But um, what's, like, one thing that makes winter foraging so appealing besides um, the oysters? <laughs> well, I mean, it depends on your uh, natural bent. So some people find winter foraging exciting because of the zombie apocalypse. 
So, you know, you need to know these things in case something goes sideways and you need to find food. That is useful, especially with all the athletic people in Vancouver and around sort of thing, Pacific yeah. Northwest that love to hike, et cetera. So from a survivalist point of view, it's good. Uh, figuring out what roots you can eat and that sort of thing. But I mean, for me as a chef, I love to focus on the things that are tastiest, not mm -hmm. just that you can gnaw on for sustenance. <laughs> um, so I try to bridge that gap. But yeah, so winter is about roots, obviously. Um, and some mushrooms, so depending on where you are. So in Vancouver, you know, our, the, the snow before this one, when I was on Galliano, so that was like a month ago or something like that, yeah. I was still seeing hedgehog mushrooms. So one of my favorite mushrooms popping up. So, um, so winter mushrooms you can get, you can get roots and then seafood. So it's all about seafood right now. Because again, like I said, the water quality is clean and clear. You can hand harvest your own uh, urchin. So that's something that... Um, I can talk about tomorrow. Yes. Um, I'm excited for that one. Yeah, totally. Sea cucumber. There's lots of different stuff. Oh, and all grabbable from the shore. Like you said, you don't have to have a boat. You don't mm -hmm. have to be a certified diver to go find these foods. You could just no. like maybe get a pair of waders on and you're good to go. Yeah. Pick them up with well tongs for, for <laughs> oh, yeah. gloves and stuff but <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna ask tomorrow how do you pick up a sea urchin <laughs> i don't know what is the safe way to do that yeah i was surprised too because i started your like online class today and just how many things are actually in most of our backyards totally like, just sitting yeah. there in my own yard the weeds that i would normally just mow over my husband we usually just mow over and we would never even think of and then you were already showing them in the first one or two little class sessions there that there's all these things just basically in the vacant lot down the street that you know the dogs aren't <laughs> peeing on or in your own backyard your yard. <laughs> yeah, maybe my front yard my dogs do pee on everything in the backyard <laughs> <laughs> little pee whatever um <laughs> Yeah, well, it's funny. I, so I just, one of the videos I posted on my YouTube channel recently was dandelion because the thing is in Vancouver, because it's still so mild and the snow is melting, I harvested uh, wild watercress as well as dandelion. Ooh. And I made um, just like a simple stir fry, right? So just like, I love, um, well, actually I did the stir fry video. And then yesterday for my birthday, I did like a fry up. So I did steak on the fire and then uh, mushrooms and tomatoes and zucchini and uh, this vegetable mm. sort of medley with pecorino cheese and chopped into it tons of dandelions. So you get this like rich, meaty, cheesy, but then the bite, the bitter bite of the dandelion to sort of right. like dandelion is your radicchio. It's our yeah. radicchio. Yeah. Exactly right. So I love dandelion. It's, and it's super good for you. So that's, yeah. Uh, yeah. That online course is, is all about those those little things we ignore, right? We think yeah. of them as oh, they're weeds, but it's like they're fabulous, tasty, and like like you said about foraging before, it's like it's about when you pick it, right? How fresh it is. Well, um, and how fresh, and like you just hit on too, how much healthier it is. Yeah. Then, like you've mentioned, like something grown out of California that maybe got picked two weeks ago and has been on a truck and in whatever and made its way somehow to where we live yep. has probably first of all, never got all the nutrients it should have had if it had ripened. Yep. And second of all, it just is never going to be as healthy as something that's full of their nutrients still. And you're just literally picking it out of the ground and cooking yep. it up. So yep, exactly. I'm so excited for our series. Um, and yes, yeah, starting tomorrow winter, winter's not a very long season here, but I'm excited for all the seafood options for sure. Yeah, me too. Yeah, That's going to be a fun chat. And everybody can find you at swallowtail.ca. That's right. And on are you Instagram? I know I'm it's following you on Facebook because that's where the Secret Club started on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, and if people want to know about Secret Suppers and the more underground sort of members only stuff, um, they can go to my website site and then email me and request to be put on the members list. So that's for people around Vancouver that want invites into the more sort of underground stuff. I'll throw that out to you the guys. Secret, super yeah. secret stuff. I like and we'll it. start those eventually. <laughs> yeah, and we then, will, and maybe we can even co-host one one day. Yes. Oh my God. That, I'd when love I have it. a kitchen again. It's, yes. Um, yeah, it's not a kitchen right now, <laughs> <laughs> but it will be fabulous. <laughs> We're hoping so. We're hoping so. Okay, I can't wait to catch up tomorrow. And thank you so much for joining us today. Great. Okay. Somebody said they love your mushroom pate, by the way.
Oh, awesome. I'm so happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, chat again tomorrow. See ya. Bye.